Hey again YouTube, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about quantum entanglement as an explanation for some of the facets of consciousness. Now obviously this is part of my quantum mind critique and I am open to being critiqued myself. So let's just, um, I'll give you a simplified version of what quantum entanglement is. Okay, so we have a property of the particle, a spin. If two particles are quantumly entangled, and one of them is up, the other is down. If this goes down, this goes up. And this, this communication is instantaneous. It doesn't happen at the speed of light. It violates um, Einstein's relativity because it's information traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, Einstein calls this spooky action at a distance. So this this is what um, quantum communications are doing. It's, it's being used by security, and I believe it's how they um, teleport, like uh, electrons um, and things like that. I believe it's only in a method of quantum entanglement, but I might be wrong about that. So this, I think, um, the quantum mind theorists put forward to explain the unity of self um, because everything's interconnected this is the unity of self I think that's the main thrust of what this entanglement is trying to explain but again I think this is a non sequitur it doesn't matter it's kind of completely irrelevant it's good to know and quantum entanglement is true and it happens but I don't think it really gets at the heart of consciousness. When we are asking questions about consciousness, we want to know, why is red red? What is this internal monologue? And, you know, the unity of self is certainly um, a difficult and um, perplexing problem, but I don't think quantum entanglement solves it. So. I mean, even in classical physics, there is still, at the heart, a, a very interconnected nature underlying everything. Take, for example, gravity. Now, we all know um, that weight is in relation to the particular, I, I, for simplification processes again, the particular planet that we're on. If I'm on planet Earth, my weight will be this much. If I'm on um, you know, Saturn, my weight will be a lot larger. And you can tell because that's um, just in relation to the particular gravitational field that you're in. But mass, we think, is unchanging. We think of mass um, as a constant. But mass is obviously related to inertia, um, the force it takes to push or pull or change the direction of the acceleration of a particular body. But this is all relative too. Because say if we had one particle, if it was an electron say, it wouldn't have any mass because it wouldn't be in relation to anything else. There'd be no forces acting upon it. Um, this is also true of its charge and any other properties you want to bestow it with. Um, so if we have two, they can both act on each other, but the more that we have, um, the more um, inertia we we also kind of put into the system. Because as we add more mass into the system, we also change how much energy it takes to move a particular particle in a particular direction. Because we change the other forces that are acting upon it. So inertia is kind of an aggregate of all these gravitational forces that are acting on a particular particle. So there is still at the heart a very related nature of the entire universe. But it just doesn't happen faster than the speed of light in classical physics. Um, similarly though, we can see um, the very interconnected nature of neurons themselves. We look a little bit more macroscopically here. Um, neurons themselves are very interdependent on which neurons they're connected to. The, the strength of those connections will, um, will 
fluctuates if, um, well, it will really interdependently on the other neurons, how much they're fired, um, etc. So the actual, the actual neural pathways which are stimulated depend entirely on which other neural pathways are stimulated. There's a very interconnected nature still at the heart of connectivist approaches to theories of mind. Um, so I really think that um, entanglement is somewhat of a non sequitur. It's important and useful to know, as is uh, quantum superposition and um, all those other aspects of quantum physics. But I don't think it answers um, the questions uh, which Penrose and Hammerer think it answers. So I think we have to be a little bit more sceptical on this issue entirely. Um, now, next week I'm, I'm going to specifically look at the Hammeroff and Penrose's arguments in a little more detail than I did in my criticism. Now, I've already taken on two of their main, um, their main arguments, that being Goldell's theorem, um, I guess uh, quantum wave collapse, and now today I've taken on another one, which is the entanglement aspect. So I'm going to look at the, the microtubules claim and look at the Grush and Churchland's um, critique of that. And then maybe a few more videos and the series will be finished. So again, any criticisms or video responses that you want to make, um, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Take care guys. Peace.